Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. A gang of car strippers has been operating in your city. From their M.O., you know they're professionals. They move fast. Your job, get them. Friends, you'll remember some months ago, we read you our first report, the six months report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight months report. Now, here is the latest one. The full 10 months report confirms again. The group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over 10 years. After 10 full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. Buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size, the cigarette that's best for you. <laughs> documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 5th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the telephone booth, and it was 10.23 p.m. when I got to the parking lot. Our car. You called in? Yeah. They haven't hit tonight so far. What's the time now? A little after 10.30. Parking lot's about empty. Yeah. The attendant left a few minutes ago. Frank? Yeah, I see him. Over there going for that Cadillac. Yeah. You got a good look at him? No, it's too dark. He's forcing the door. Come on. All right. All right, hold it up there. He's in the car, Joe. All right, hold it up. He isn't going to stop. Watch it. He's heading for that intersection. He'll never get through. Pretty bad, Joe. Yeah, he really cracked into that dodge, didn't he? All right, let us through, please. Come on, please let us through. I'll check the Cadillac. Right, I'll get the other car. Okay. The three people in that dodge are lucky. Doesn't look too bad. I'll call the ambulance. Yeah, we'll tell them to hurry. I don't think this one's going to wait. 10.46 p.m., the ambulance arrived, and after emergency treatment at the scene, the victims were removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. A traffic car had been dispatched to investigate the accident. Upon arrival at the emergency hospital, we were informed that the suspect had died on the way. The dead body was identified by his personal effects as Charles Roxford, age 16. The Juvenile Bureau was contacted, and they requested that in the course of our investigation, we notify the boy's family. 11.27 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the address listed on the victim's identification was a house above the Sunset Strip. We rang the bell and waited. I'll try it again. Yeah. Somebody's coming. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mrs. Roxford? That's right. What is it? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Police? Well, come in. I don't know what you want with us, but come in. Thank you. Come into the living room. Thank you very much. Now, sit down. What is it? There's been an accident, Mrs. Roxford. An accident? Yes, ma'am. Pretty bad one. What's this got to do with me? Well, you see, ma'am, your boy was... 
Joe? Well, we're sorry to have to tell you this, ma'am, but your boy was in an accident tonight. Charles? Yes, ma'am. You said it was a bad accident. Yes, ma'am, we did. How bad? How bad? Your son's dead, ma'am. Charles? Charles Roxford? Uh, uh, you're sure you have the right house? Yes, ma'am. We're sorry, Ms. Roxford. Oh. Charlie, he, he was only a baby. Just a baby. Oh, you're sure there's no mistake? You're sure? Afraid not, ma'am. How did it happen? Well, it was an automobile accident, ma'am. In an automobile? Yes, ma'am. Your boy was driving a car. Oh, but Charlie doesn't have a car. He doesn't drive. Your boy was driving a stolen car, Mrs. Roxford. What? Your son had a stolen car, ma'am. He was trying to get away. Well, that's not true. Afraid it is, ma'am. No. You're lying to me. Charles wouldn't do a thing like that. Afraid that's the way it is, ma'am. Oh. That's terrible. I can't believe that Charlie'd do something like that. I thought I knew him. I, I didn't think he'd do anything like that. Well, did you see it? The accident? Were, were you there? Yes, ma'am, we were. How did it happen? Well, he'd stolen the car, ma'am. He tried to escape. He ran the car out into a crowded street. One of the cars in the traffic didn't have time to stop. Your boy ran right into it. Wasn't there something you could do to stop him? Well, we tried, ma'am. Yelled at him. He almost ran us down. You know where your boy was tonight, Mrs. Roxford? No. No, he had dinner and then said he was going out. I, I thought he was going to a show or something. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know where he was going. Did he leave the house alone? Yes. Left right after dinner, about eight. Said he'd be back later. Said he... He'd see me later that he left. Is there anything we can get for you, Mrs. Roxford? No, no, nothing. Where's your husband, ma'am? I guess he's at his office. He sells insurance. Said he had to meet a client tonight. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about this. Going to hit him awfully hard, awfully hard. Yes, ma'am. He and the boy were very close. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about it. Did the boy give you any idea during dinner as to what he was going to do after he left? No. No, he didn't. I didn't talk much to him. Ma'am. Well, you see, I wasn't here. I was out most of the afternoon. I, I didn't get home until just before he left. He just finished dinner, and then he left. I see, ma'am. I was at the bridge club. I always go on Tuesdays. Oh, if I'd known, if I'd only known what was going to happen. Am I going to see him? Well, we want either you or your husband to identify him, ma'am. Charlie, he's dead. Just a baby, just a little boy. You were there. You could have done something. You're police officers. Isn't that your job? Beg your pardon? Well, isn't it your job to help people to do something when they're in trouble? Well, yes, ma'am, I suppose it is, but it was a little late for that one. What does that mean? Well, he was 16 when we met him, Ms. Roxby. What's that got to do with it? Somebody should have tried a long time ago. <laughs> Most car thefts fall into three basic categories well known by all police officers. First, the cars that are stolen by professionals who change the motor numbers, forge owner certificates, repaint the bodies, and sell them throughout the country. The second group consists of joy riders, thieves who steal the cars for a few hours merely to ride around in them and then leave them on the streets. The third category, and the one we've been working on for the past six weeks, dealt with the activities of car strippers. Their MO followed the usual pattern for this type of crime. The car would be stolen and then driven to some lonely part of the city. There, all usable accessories would be removed. Radios, tires, air horns, side mirrors, anything that could be resold would be taken. In certain cases, the articles would be stolen while the car remained parked where the owner had left it. We found that the gang had become so proficient that they could break into a car and remove the radio as well as other accessories in under 10 minutes. Avenues of sale for the stolen merchandise had been checked. Known dealers in stolen property had been questioned. As the days went on, the total of thefts went up. By the 5th of August, the gang had stolen over $12,000 in automobile accessories. In the instances where we'd been able to get a description of men loitering in the vicinity of the stripped cars, we'd had the witnesses check mug books in the hope of identifying the thieves. We'd gotten no new leads. Physical evidence at the scene of the abandoned cars had been checked and rechecked. It netted us nothing. A week passed. August 14th, 8.15 a.m. Frank and I got back to the office. Captain's really boiling, isn't he? Yeah, you can't blame him, though. They gotta stop cold. Well, we gotta get a break in it sometime. All the luck can't stay on their side. I don't know. It looks like it could happen that way. Anything on the steakhouse last night? No, nothing that we got so far. Maybe something later. I get it. Auto theft Friday. 
I beg your pardon, ma'am? Well, no. Well, yeah. What was that again? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yes, ma'am. All right, what was that address again? Yes, I, I have a yeah, All right, well, we'll send a unit out. I'm sure they can help you. No, I suggest you get in touch with the SPCA. No, SPCA, yes, that's... All right, bye. Well, there's a dandy one. What's that? Woman lost a cat from her car. I want to know if we could get it back for her. Yeah? Says it's real easy to recognize. He has a collar on and he answers the name of Tabby. Oh, that makes it easier. Yeah. Out of that, Smith. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh-huh. Well, where are you calling from, sir? Yes, sir, that's on Wilshire, right? All right, sir, we'll be right there. Anything? Yeah, a doctor out on Wilshire parked his car out in front of his office. Yeah. Came back in ten minutes, his car radio was gone. Eight fifty-six a.m., Frank and I got to the doctor's office. It was in a large medical building out on Wilshire Boulevard. We went up to the second floor and talked to the man who placed the call, a Dr. Alex Halsey. He told us that he'd stopped at his office on the way to a hospital call. He'd parked his car immediately in front of the building. When he returned ten minutes later, he found that the radio had been stolen. From his office, we called the crime lab and latent fingerprints detail. Crews of men were sent from both divisions. They went over the car for possible physical evidence. Frank and I, along with Dr. Halsey, went down to the street. We talked to him while the officers worked. Darndest thing I ever saw. I tell you, I wasn't in the building more than 10 minutes. 10 minutes outside. Yes, sir. Came back, and I could see right away that the door had been opened. Uh-huh. First, I thought maybe I'd left it open. Then when I got in the car, I knew right away. As soon as I saw the radio was gone. Yes, sir. Did you notice anyone loitering around your car when you parked in? Anybody suspicious, maybe? No, no, I didn't. Of course, I might not have noticed anyone. Had my mind on Julie. Julie? Yes, I'm operating on her this afternoon. Poor little kid has an intestinal disorder. Only three months old. Gee, that's too bad. Yes, she'll be fine, though. Of course, the parents are worried. They always are. Can't convince them there's nothing to worry about. Yes, sir. Then you didn't notice anyone, huh? No, like I said, I didn't. You sure you locked your car, sir, when you left it? Oh, yes, I'm sure about that. Always make it a practice to lock it when I leave it. Lots of times I leave instruments in it. Always have to be careful about the instruments. Oh, yes, sir, I always lock it. How about the windows? What? The windows. Did you roll them all the way up? Roll them up. Well, now, once in a while I don't. Try to think of that. I'm not sure about this morning. No, come to think of it, I guess I didn't close them this morning. Such a wonderful day. Yes, sir, well, that's probably how they got into your car. You happen to have the serial number of the radio, Dr. Halsey? No, no, I don't think I have. Might be on the papers. I just got the car a couple of months ago. Might be on the papers. I can check them for you. All right, sir. That'll help. I'll have my secretary look them up for you right away. Anyone else drive the car, Dr. Halsey? Oh, no, sir. Don't believe in that. I'm the only one. Been the only one to drive it. Don't believe in lending the car to somebody else. Never have believed in it. Mm-hmm. Joe? Excuse me a minute, Dr. Halsey. Sure, Lang. Yeah, Leonard. You got a couple of clean prints on the dashboard. Might belong to the thief. Yeah. I'd like to check the doctor. It might be his. Okay. Wait a minute. I'll get the kit. I know. Hey, Dr. Halsey. Yes, Sergeant. Okay. Uh, this is Sergeant Tankersley of the fingerprint department. He'd like to check your prints. How do you do, sir? All right, doctor. wonder if I could look at your fingers, please. Surely. Can you tell just from looking at them what you want to know? No, sir, but you see the prints we found are plural. If your prints were loops, there'd be no reason to take them. Oh, oh, yes. Uh-huh, I see. How about it, Lenny? Better roll them up for comparison. Hmm? We're going to take your prints, Doctor, if you have no objection. Oh, no, no, of course not. Glad to help. All right, sir. You want to step over here? We can take them in the officer's car. Yes, glad to. Here, I'll get the door. Here, I'll get the pad. Now, Doctor, if you let me have your hand. Surely, here. And no, sir, if you let me do it, it'd be a little easier. Uh, oh, yes. Just trying to help. I will put them on the card. Never knew my fingers were so big. Just that we're taking the print of the whole tip of the finger, sir. Makes it look that way. Oh, well, I see. Uh -huh. All right, doctor, you can get the ink off with this, I think. Here, I'll pour a little on this cloth. Here you go. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. What do you think, Leonard? I'll check them now. Sure be a break if they were the thieves. Mm. Well, there must be. Couldn't be anyone else's. Well, how about your family, Doctor? Possible the prince could be theirs, maybe? Oh, no, no, no chance. Jenny, that's my wife. She has her own car. Kids always use that one. Like I said, I'm the only one who uses this. Uh-huh. How about it, Len? Make them? Yeah. They belong to the Doctor. 
10.02 a.m., the crime lab crew gathered what physical evidence they could find and returned to check over their findings. Frank and I took a report from Dr. Halsey, and then we talked to his secretary. She was unable to find the ownership papers on the car. We drove over to the dealer who had sold him the car and got the serial number of the stolen radio. We notified pawn shop detail and gave them the information. For the next three weeks, stakeouts on the parking lots in the central area continued. Arrests were made, but the thieves apparently had no connection with the gang we were after. They kept hitting, but the speed with which they operated made apprehending them difficult. On Friday, September 5th, we got a call that a stolen car had been recovered out in Topanga Canyon. We drove out to check on it. The tires, radio, horns, heater, spotlights, fog lights, and the side view mirrors had been taken. The seat covers had been removed and the hubcaps were missing. Again, there was no physical evidence that gave us a lead to the thieves. That night at 10.52 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. Another long day. Yeah, kind of tired myself. Kind of hate to call Faye. Why's that? Oh, this morning when I left, I told her I'd be home for dinner, sure. Well, didn't you call her? No, I forgot all about it. She's really going to be sore. Yeah, well, she'll get over it. I don't know, Joe. It's going to be a couple of days of quiet around the house, I think. Why, just because you missed a meal? No, it ain't that. She had tamale pie for dinner. Boy, she sure makes it good, too. A lot of cheese, you know? Yeah, well, she can warm it up for you when you get home. Here, go ahead. All right. You want to sign us out, I'll check the book. Yeah, I'll get it. Anything? Yeah, a call from Brennan out in Wilshire. I'll call him. Hello, Brennan around? Yeah, all right. Say what it was about? No, I'm calling him now. Yeah, hi, Brennan. It's Friday. Yeah, you did, huh? Where'd that happen? No kidding. Where was the break, something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Brennan. Picked up a kid for running a red light, driving a hot rod. Yeah? Car was fixed up with a lot of new stuff. Guys out of Wilshire checked it over. Uh-huh. According to the serial number on the radio, it was stolen from Dr. Halsey. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. In 1952... American smokers bought more Chesterfields than ever before in the history of the industry. Today, sales are still going up. Smokers everywhere are changing to Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King Size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every King Size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that King Size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Remember... The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Eleven twenty-seven p.m., Frank and I drove out to Wilshire Division. We checked with Sergeant Brennan, and he told us how the boy had been picked up. He'd run a red light at the corner of Pico and La Brea. He'd been stopped by two officers in a cruiser car. He was driving a cut-down 49 Ford that was equipped with Cadillac hubcaps, white sidewall tires, Chrysler horns, and a Cadillac radio. The officers had started to question him, and he'd attempted to escape. He'd been apprehended and brought to the station to be interrogated. In checking the serial number of the radio, the men from Wilshire Division had discovered that it was stolen and had left word for us. 11.45 p.m., we went to an interview room to talk to the boy. What's your name, son? Martin. First name? Herb. Herb Martin. You know why you're here, don't you? Yeah. You want to tell us where you got that stuff? I bought it. Where? In different places. You remember where? Not right off. How old are you? Nineteen. Where do you live? It's on the report. We're asking you. Come on, Herb. 8297 Marianne Drive. Where were you going when they stopped you? Home. Where'd you been? Around. Same place you bought that stuff on your car, huh? Yeah, that's right. Now, look, you better come off this young fella. You might think you're a big man, but you got things a little mixed up here. 
You got caught with a carload of stolen accessories. There's been a lot of stealing going on around town. The way your car looks, you could be responsible for it. Yeah, well, I'm not. You look good for it. Look, maybe I lifted the radio and stuff, but that don't mean I'm in on the other. Sure, I got no choice. You got me nailed for the stuff you found, but I'm not going to take it for the others. Maybe I stole that stuff, but that was for me. I didn't sell it like the others. Now, leave me alone, huh? What do you mean, others? I don't know what you mean. You said the others. Well, I didn't mean others like well, that. Well, how did you mean it? Well, like the guys you're looking for. That's not the way it sounded. No, you said it like you knew who you were talking about. I didn't say it like that. That's the way it sounded. That's right, son. Now, why don't you tell us who you meant? Look, Herb, we haven't got all day. Come on, boy. We're going to get them sometime. Who'd you mean? All right, I'll tell you. We continued to talk to Herb Martin. He told us of the activities of a gang of car strippers who were working on order. He went on to say that from what he'd heard, if someone wanted to pick up some fast money, a connection could be made with a man on the corner of Sunset and Western. The man would give the order for the stolen merchandise and say where and at what time it was to be delivered. Herb told us that he had the opportunity to do business with the man, but that he turned it down. He was unable to identify the man who made the contact and said that he'd never heard him referred to by name. He gave us the names and addresses of two of the men who were working for him. 12.45 a.m., Frank and I left and drove back downtown. With the assistance of officers from Wilshire Division, the two young men were brought in for questioning. They identified their contact as a Richard R. Ogden. We ran the name through R&I and found that Ogden had a previous record of petty theft. From the 510 in his package, we obtained his last known address, but the landlady told us that he'd moved and left no forwarding address. She told us, however, that she thought we could find him at the Meyer Garage on South Hoover. We drove over and found that it was a small place on the corner of Hoover and Mariposa. The owner, Alan Meyer, told us that Ogden did work for him, but that he was out. He said that the suspect was expected back almost any time. While we talked to him, Meyer worked on a small foreign car. Great little cars. Get a real kick out of working on them. Yeah, sure nice looking. You sell them, do you? No, I just service them. Mm -hmm. Oh, now and then I get accessories for them. You know, I order them up, install them. Cost too much to keep a regular stock of them. Yeah. When did you say that Ogden would be back? We should be here now. Probably got hung up someplace. Yeah, latest thing is a hard top. Made out of laminated fiberglass. Is that right? Yeah, fits right over them. Kind of makes them look like a small roll, you know? Then with wire wheel caps, baggage racks, wind wings, you can put a lot of money in them. Yeah, I guess so. What about all this other stuff here? Is that for these foreign cars, too? Yeah, what do you mean? Oh, the tires, the hubcaps here. No, no, that's where I make most of my money. I go out and buy them from Rex, bring them back here, straighten them out, resell them to the independent stations around town. They can sell them a lot cheaper than new ones run. We both make a little money out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say, you guys like some peanuts? No. No, no, thanks. Okay, you don't mind if I have some, huh? Sure you don't want any? No, thank you very much. I guess I'm hungry in the morning. I'll keep these things around and munch on. Yeah. Go through a whole can of these a day. <laughs> that kill me. Now, get started on the things you can't stop. You sure you don't want some? Huh? No, no, thanks. How long have you known this Ogden, Meyer? Oh, let's see. Uh, I guess it's been 10 years anyway. He went to work for me a year ago. Mm -hmm. Good man. Brought a lot of business in. Say, what does you want to see him about? Oh, we'd like to talk to him. You don't want to tell me, huh? Be better if we talk to him, Mr. Meyer. Yeah. Well, here he is now. Hey, Dick. Yeah? A couple of fellas here want to see you. Yeah, what is it? You're Richard Ogden? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. What is it you guys want me for? I'd like to talk to you, Ogden. Well, go ahead. Might be better if we went outside. Well, look, you can talk to him here. I got some work I can do in the office. Don't want to bother you, Mr. Meyer. No, no trouble at all. Well, now, what's this all about? You know a couple of kids named Jerry Z. Swanson and uh, Harry T. Benson? Swanson and Benson? No, I don't think I do. They say they know you. They say they do some work for you. I'm sorry to bother you. I forgot my peanuts. It's all right, sir. I'll be in the office if you need anything. Thank you, sir. No, anything at all. Yes, sir. What about it, Ogden? What about what? You know the kids? It's Benson and Swanson? No, I told you what. All right, mister, let's go downtown. We'll talk it over there, huh? What for? Why are you pulling me in? I want you to meet the two boys if you don't know them. Well, what's that going to prove? We want to know why they named you. Why they said you were responsible for the car stripping that's been going on. You mean you believe them? We've got no reason not to. I don't think they'd stage a thing like this. they got a lot to lose. So have I. You get me down there and those two kids point me out and I haven't got a chance. Even if I'm not the one and they say I am, you won't give me a break. No, if you haven't done anything, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm not going. Alan? Hey, Alan. Yeah, what is it, Dick? Come here, will you? Yeah, right away. What's the matter? Something wrong? Well, these guys are going to take me to jail. Well, what for? What's he done? We want to talk to him, Meyer. We think he's involved in some car thefts. 
Well, I know that's not true. Dick wouldn't do a thing like that. I know. I've known him a long time. No, I'm sorry, sir, but the information we've got says he did. Why, Dick? Why'd you do a thing like that? Hmm? If what these officers say is true, well... Gee, that's awful. Why would you do a thing like that? What are you talking about? All right, come on, Argyle. Let's go. No, I'm not going. I think you better do what the officers say, Dick. It'll be better if you don't cause any trouble. Well, wait a minute. What are you trying to prove with this? I don't know what you mean. Next thing, you'll be trying to involve me in this. Yeah, well, that's just what I'm going to do. You see, officers, that's terrible. Well, don't you listen to him. He's the guy behind the whole thing. Look over there, the tires, all this stuff. Sure, I stole them. I had the kids go out and pick them up, but he set it up. He sold them to the stations. He took most of the money. The whole whole thing was his idea. Well, Dick, how can you say that? Well, I but... can say it because it's true. I'll tell you all about it. You take him downtown, I'll tell you all about it. You're not going to let me stand for this alone. And to think that he'd do a thing like this to me after we've been friends for so long. Bring me stolen merchandise to sell. You got anything to back up what you're saying, Ogden? Sure I have. You just bet I can back it up. Go ahead. Well, you look at his books. Not the ones he's got out in the open, but you look at the ones in the safe. It's all there. All the deals he's made with the owners of the stations, all the orders, what he paid the kids for them, and what he got for them. Didn't think I knew about it, did you? A whole lousy year I've been doing the dirty work for him. Well, I've had it. I'm through. I've had it. Let me take the beef. What a crumb. I'll show him. I don't understand it. Friends for so long. I'd have gotten you out. Ten years we've been friends. I trusted you all that time. Then you sold me out. Why? Well, that shouldn't be too tough for you to figure. Huh? You showed him how. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 21st, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Remember, only Chesterfield gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. After ten full months, the group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. Now, speaking personally as a Chesterfield smoker, I know they're best for me. Either way you like them, you'll find Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> Richard R. Ogden and Alan Y. Meyer were tried and convicted of receiving stolen property. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Receiving stolen property is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than ten years or in the county jail for not more than one year. The investigation of the records of Alan Y. Meyer uncovered the names of the other men involved in the thefts. They, along with Herbert S. Martin, Jerry Z. Swanson, and Harold T. Benson, were tried on a charge of grand theft auto and convicted. They were sentenced to the state penitentiary at San Quentin, California, for the term as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than ten years. Ladies and gentlemen, ten million Americans have diseases of the heart and blood vessels. What are the causes and the cures? Well, it'll take research to find out. Send what you can to heart, care of your local post office. Help your heart fund. Help your heart. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Sarah Selby, Art Gilmore. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC.